Sholem Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. Let me give some clarification as to who we, the Buddhist movement, actually are. Abraham Weisfeld, PhD, founder and chairman of the revolution. Donna Newman, founder and emissary of Solidarity. Myself, Comrade Net Ben Yehoshua, founder and cleric of Public Relations. Isaiah P. Kometstein, Councilman of Committees. Uri Adia, Councilman of National Affairs. Miriam Emisberg, Councilwoman of Education. Hannah Toff, Councilwoman of Strategic Projects and Marvin Eliyahu, Councilman of World Forums. I have noticed repeatedly that there is some sort of confusion going on among people. Originally I just saw this confusion out here in Arizona and now it's even being spread on fictional internet use. And now, mind you, this was always fiction. It was fiction out here in the little comic strips that they were making, and now it's spread to the internet, and somehow people have mistaken this for, for reality. The notion that they make up is that the, the Bundist movement, uh, and that Bundism in general, is about creating some sort of homeland in Eastern Europe where we all speak Yiddish. Uh, the Jewish people uh, uh, have much different aspirations than than, than, than that. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> that's a different ter tendency. That's a different tendency known as territorialism. The Bundist movement has the objective for national cultural autonomy. Yes, our goal for ourselves is national cultural autonomy. We don't necessarily want to get rid of the sovereignty of other countries, and yet we do want to get rid of statehood. And at the same time, we will tolerate the notion of statehood if you remove the nation state and switch to federation states. However, so, so basically, we prefer federation states over nation states, but we also prefer democratic federations over federation states. So yeah, um, in fact, I, I think I think we we've just had a, a, enough of the nation state. It the nation state concept, which has the ideology of nationalism is not something going back into antiquity, it's rather new. It has been the source of a lot of conflicts. You could solve the Syrian crisis by, for instance, having a federation state with a constituent assembly respecting both the Kurdish and the Syrians. There's so much problems with the nation state. When a state is fused with a ni with a nation, often the other nations that are within get trampled on then by the host nation. It's disastrous. The Bundist movement is developing theory. We are keeping all of the basic essentials that have always been distingu distinguishedly Bundist. So all characteristics that are distinguishable to Bundism, all of the all of the notions that are distinctly Bundist that we encourage other national minorities seeking re liberation, you know, proceed to, we have kept. We have adopted a sort of democratic centralism, but we are not a vanguard party. We are a vanguard, but not a vanguard party. Okay. We could be considered similar, I suppose, and there's a difference between our, our vanguard that we are and vanguard of education, which are two different things. And even those things are still in development. I would say that we are more of a vanguard block, maybe we're not, that depends on how we're choosing to define it. What we are is probably, if I had to describe it, we are a... We're basically a vanguard organization. 
of theory. Vanguard parties are very unattractive in Buddhism. We are adopting certain concepts from Marxism-Leninism, but at the end of the day, we don't even feel comfortable with that term. Modern Buddhism would fall in the category of pantheism. However, Buddhism is Buddhism. It's not a communist notion. Communists may be socialists, but to assume that all socialists are communists is wrong. Communism is a very particular theory that certain socialists wish to achieve. So the Buddhist movement is developing a theory. It's still in development. And we are keeping all of the basic essentials. And I'm getting a lot of mail to me as a to my personal emails, and this is why I don't have all the old email addresses I had anymore, um, addressing me as the Bundist movement. I am not the Bundist movement. I try my best to represent the Bundist movement because I am the cleric of public relations in the Bundist movement. But with a lot of sleep deprivation and a lot going on, this has actually caused me to get confused. We have a lot of problems here in Arizona. We have a human trafficking tr crisis going on. We, <laughs> we have f fascism out here. Most of the integrated poor don't want it. And, you know, the, in Arizona, the poor are very integrated. I've been talking a lot about this. Uh, this has been circulating in our discussions here in Arizona. But we are beyond Arizona. We are an international group. Dr. Abram Weisfeld has never even been to Arizona. Seven of us are here in Arizona, and one of us hasn't, and we would like Dr. Abram Weisfeld to be here in Arizona with us. At the end of this video, I'm going to try to speak what I think will be the different clauses between myself, Dr. Weisfeld, and Donna Newman, because the three of us, the three of us are supposed to be able to invoke clauses on ourselves, and this is still not determined. Nothing is completely solidified because we have not finished the manifesto, and it takes all eight of us to, to build that manifesto. We are trying to safeguard Buddhism from people trying to infiltrate it, in fact, from territorialists, from Zionists, from different groups that may try to change who we are. We didn't just decide, for instance, oh, we're Marxist-Leninist. I don't even consider myself a Marxist-Leninist at all, thank you very much. I would say that I have strong Marxist-Leninist Maoist leanings but I'm a Bundist. <laughs> Let's get that clear. I'm a Bundist. And if you want to meet, if you if you took me out of a Jewish context, I'd just be a, 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 revolu a revolutionary socialist. But I am Jewish. First and foremost, I am Jewish. And the Bundism cares about Jewishness. Bundism cares about Judaism. Bundism cares about liberation of the Jewish people, as we are a marginalized group with no representation in the United States when it comes to media forums. The Zionists won't let us speak. They are married to the Americanists and their interests are united. There has to be a centralized theory, yet we can not escape the folly of the communist theory unless we admit that there's something wrong with the communist theory, and part of that is the Hegelian dialect, which we completely reject. So even though we have adopted a certain Marxist-Leninist even though we've adopted a certain Marxist-Leninist template, let's get something clear here. We reject much of what Marxist-Leninists believe when it comes to the way that they speak. They speak in a Hegelian dialect. That is the problem with Marxism and anarchism. Anarchi anarchists often don't understand that there's a difference between nation-state, country, and you can't be too upset with them by that. They're using the Hegelian dialect. That's why you can't be too upset with Marxists. They're just going by their own logic. They have theories that are true, but the theories are still flawed. You could have a, a true theory, and it could still be flawed because of some problem within there, some contradiction within the theory. And one of the largest contradictions stems completely from the Hegelian dialect. Dialectical materialism can be true, but it could still be flawed because of something like that. And this is some conversation we would like to put out there. And I have perhaps tried too hard, and with all of this going on, it's, it's becoming quite a hassle. I apologize to everybody who has been put off 
I thank all the young viewers who have given me encouragement and find it refreshing, but now I'm going to try to be balanced between what is appropriate and what appeals to young people. Because to the young viewers, I would like to say, understand that we should be respecting our elders. They have been here longer. I know I've got complaints about how they're out of touch with you, but understand, you here, in, and when I speak to you, I'm speaking to most of you here in the United States, you know what's going on in Palestine because of what we told you was going on in Palestine and because you heard about it on other various social forms and media. But Dr. Weisfeld is there right now. He is in Palestine right now. And he is way more aware of what's going on over there than you are. This isn't about ego wars. This isn't about me, 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 I, I, I. Which is a trap I consistently try really hard not to fall into, and I've fallen into pretty much most of my life over and over again, and I consistently try to pull myself out of it. This cult of the self, which I have been a consistent victim of, and it's time for you, the young people here in the West, to realize that you are large victims of this. Individualism is part of the problem. If you want the individual protective protected, you're going to have to believe in collectivism because, I have said before, with the problem of the libertarian, the right-wing libertarian notion, if someone's freedom is the freedom to take away someone else's freedom, then that freedom does not exist. And furthermore, freedom is actually liberty, and liberty is actually autonomy. It's time to break loose from the false dialectics that keep us entrapped. I apologize to everybody for certain behaviors I've displayed. They do not reflect the Buddhist movement, and they don't even reflect me on my normative days. There's been a lot of rush, and we still have a lot of footage that got put to the side because of several crises happening out here in Arizona. One of them being that the fascist raids are unknown by a lot of people who just don't want to know it, and the mainstream media of Arizona ap appeases, um, caters to the Arizona population by not informing them of the truth. Because they know people don't want to know the truth, and therefore they cater on that context. And it is not tyranny for the press to tell the truth. And the press is not there to tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to know. I have always wanted to be a journalist. And I try my best to do that here. But the fact of the matter is, is I'm just one person, and there's a lot of us here. And the pressure on all eight of us, the seven of us here in Arizona, and Dr. Weisfeld in Palestine, will be a lot more lifted the more people come and join us. We are still screening members. And there will be more to say in the next video, and I will try to recap of this at the end of this video. I'm going to turn you to a film you need to see that came out in the fall of 2011 when Ben Lorber, I sure hope I'm not butchering his name, Ben Lorber interviewed Dr. Abraham Weisfeld in Annapolis, Palestine. This was in the fall of 2011. Hello, I'm here today with Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, co-founder of the Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians in the 1980s and founder of the Jewish People's Liberation Organization, or JPLO, also in the 1980s. We're here in sunny Nablus in Palestine, and I want to talk to Abraham Westfeld today about the history of Zionism, the tragedy of Zionism in the 20th century. So last time we talked, Dr. Wood, Dr. Weisfeld, we talked about the opposition between socialist Zionism and Bundist socialism. But I wanted to ask you if there's anything in the early legacy of socialist Zionism worth saving. Did early socialist Zionism have at least an international impulse? In theory, though in practice it advocated a nationalism, did, it, did, did the theory behind it advocate internationalism? Well, there is a current of uh, socialist Zionism called uh, cultural Zionism. And uh, this was a tendency 
that advocated a uh, binational Palestine or binational Israel, which had a certain sense of recognition of the existence of the Palestinian people and uh, sought to accommodate the presence, the existence of the Palestinian people, together with that of the um, Israeli uh, Jewish population, and called for a binational uh, federation of sorts. But at the same time, they were supporting a Zionist state. So they had a contradiction between the Zionist nation-state concept and a binational society concept. And uh, because of this contradiction, they ultimately failed. Uh, some of the founders, like Magnus, uh, were the uh, co-founders of the uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, which had an uh, internationalist or secular flavor to it. Uh, but otherwise, they uh, didn't achieve, uh, did not achieve very much, and um, only left behind, you know, perhaps the one word by nationalism. So the uh, the socialist Bundists were actually working towards the international struggle against capitalism, towards uh, betterment of humanity. But the, in the theory of the socialist Zionists, at least. Did they connect their project in Palestine at all with the hope of an international socialist or communist revolution, or was it purely uh, focused around the Jewish people and the uh, the end of anti-Semitism and the strengthening of the Jewish nation? Well, they had a position that was uh, anti-Zionist for Jewish reasons, uh, not for the uh, Palestinian reasons. There wasn't very much uh, uh, awareness of the existence of the Palestinian people at the time, neither by the Zionists nor the anti-Zionists, actually. And uh, the Jewish Bund, uh, which was the Jewish Workers uh, Socialist Movement, that was uh, a faction within the uh, Russian Social Democratic Party, uh, comprised uh, 35,000 members in 1903, and uh, they were uh, struggling for the the rights of the Jewish workers who were a lower class to the working class in Poland and Russia. And they uh, also had a sense of uh, demanding political rights and for the collective uh, Jewish people as a whole, which uh, amounted to a civil rights movement, as in the uh, U.S. African American civil rights movement. However, they demanded collective rights, not merely individual uh, civil rights. And uh, this uh, sense of collective rights was encapsulated by the formulation national cultural autonomy, which was a concept developed by the Bund, not at its founding in 1897, when it was founded on the basis of civil rights and workers' rights, but uh, later on in 1903, when they had to account for themselves in the uh, Russian Social Democratic Party, where they were being accused of being um, separatists or segregationists. So in response, they said, no, we're not uh, separatists or segregationists. We don't want to isolate the Jewish people from other peoples. We want to live together with other peoples in a sense of internationalism. But they wanted to have recon recognition of the plight of the Jewish people and the Jewish workers who were subjected to an additional degree of oppression, national oppression, which rendered the Jewish working class poorer than the regular Jewish, uh, Polish working class or Russian working class. So it required a national dimension and uh, national organizations in order to represent them because the regular organizations and the uh, regular uh, political system did not uh, take into consideration the rights of the Jewish people, either as people or as workers. So, the Jewish national cultural autonomy represented th this concept, and uh, it was uh, rejected at the time by both the uh, Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. Blekhanov tried to insult the Bund by calling uh, us uh, the uh, Zionists who had seasickness because we didn't want to leave Poland, but we wanted uh, national recognition nonetheless. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, national recognition or the, um, the identity of Jewish people as such 
was common to all of the four Jewish political tendencies at the time who were secular. There were the uh, Jewish Bund, then there was the uh, Zionist movement, then there was the Jewish Autonomous Movement, which founded the World Jewish Congress. Which later became Zionist. Did it become Zionist or...? Not necessarily. Yeah. And then there were also the uh, fourth uh, political tendency, which is called Territorialist. Yeah. All these four political tendencies, which differed from one another, all recognize the nature of the Jewish national identity. That is, that there exists a Jewish nation even though all the members of this nation had dual identities and also considered themselves to be Polish or Russian or whatever, or American, in addition to being Jewish. For Jewish people, there's no conflict between having a dual identity. You can be both Jewish and British, or Jewish and French, or Jewish and American. You know, there's no such uh, contradiction. There is a certain set of uh, political culture in the United States which considers that there is a contradiction between claiming national identity other than that of being an American. However, this is an illusion. It's a false identity. False consciousness, as it's called in uh, political theory. Now, the national cultural autonomy claimed by the Jewish Bund uh, was picked up as a concept by none other than the uh, Austrian um, political theorist uh, Otto Bauer, who was uh, Jewish-Austrian, although he didn't consider himself to be Jewish, because he had uh, more so the uh, American conception that in order to uh, claim equal citizen rights within a given uh, nation-state, you had to uh, stake your claim to be a member of that nation and only of that nation. So instead, Otto Bauer wrote a whole thesis about the matter, which I've read and integrated into my doctoral thesis. And in this thesis, he projects national cultural autonomy, which is a concept that he obtained from the Jewish Bund, and it applies it to the Hungarian population, who were part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire before the First World War. The uh, empire that had um, a double eagle as a symbol, and was ruled by the um, uh, Austrian... Um, monarch. And in order to accommodate the Hungarian population within this empire, in order to, in, in effect, preserve this empire, this social democratic political theorist projected uh, a constitutional provision for national cultural autonomy for the Hungarian population, even though he rejected it for the Jewish population, which resided in Austria and Hungary. Why was it because the Jewish population wasn't in one territory like the Hungarians were? Precisely. Because he considered national identity to be um, linked with a, a territorial locale, which is, in effect, um, an economistic uh, position. Because if you have a certain population concentrated in a certain territory, then you have a certain economy associated with that particular national formation, which means, in effect, that you have a national bourgeoisie. And the social democratic conception, uh, which accommodated itself to the nation-state concept, also accommodated itself to the existence of a national bourgeoisie, with whom which they considered themselves to uh, uh, be making an accommodation. They sought to make an accommodation mm -hmm. to regulate a capitalist economy in the interest of the working class. So is that why the you know the the Communist Manifesto and Marx's idea of the proletariat was one that inherently broke with territorial boundaries because... Yes, it was an economistic position derived from historical materialism. Materialist in the sense of economist. Economism meaning that uh, they did an analysis from a purely economic point of view, which may be a materialist, but it certainly is not uh, political. You know, a political uh, analysis comprises much more than an economic analysis. But you said, so So whenever a people is defined in terms of territory, that already implies the existence of a bourgeoisie. Precisely. Right? But so the proletariat then is by definition, you know, extraterritorial. It's, it's an uh, international uh, people that aren't bound to, to territory. That's right, because the proletariat is not tied to private property. It's not tri tied to a private... Uh, piece of land is not tied to a, a private corporation which is situated in one locale. Okay? 
notwithstanding the transnationals of today. Now, the bourgeoisie is tied to a particular territory, a particular economy, because there it has authority, it can regulate their own economy, but they cannot do so in any other territory. So the territory is a, is a consequence of the nature of private property itself, which is not the case for the working class. So that's where the social democracy errs, because they um, are tied to a nation-state concept, which is in effect tied to a national bourgeoisie. So is that why Zionism was a bourgeoisie theory also? Because like above all, it saw it as used to have a territory and that kind of place, a nation state. Yes, this was made uh, explicit by the Zionist theoretician in Russia called Ber Berach. Berkhov, who uh, considered that the Jewish uh, people were abnormal because they had um, an inverted pyramid, so to speak, in which the working class um, was uh, predominant uh, in the uh, population, and then there was a, uh, a rather um, emaciated, you know, uh, national bourgeoisie amongst the Jewish uh, people, mm -hmm. predominantly located in the um, financial sector, in, in a very lim limited number, with no particular. Uh, territorial um, uh, affiliation, no uh, nation state with whom that uh, they were subordinate to, nor uh, responsible for, and therefore uh, Ber Berkhov said that the only way in order to um, regulate the nature of the Jewish people was to put them into a context which is the same as any other European nation state. That is, that there had to be created a nation state for the Jewish people that would create a national bourgeoisie, which could then be overthrown by the Jewish working class to make a socialist, you know, uh, country, which was completely contrary, you know, to the uh, to the initial intention. If that was, if that's uh, what the intention was in the first place. So he thought that the establishment of a state for the Jews in Palestine would create a bourgeoisie there, but then that bourgeoisie actually establishment of the state would be overthrown. Yes, you know, it's it's this theory of of a. Uh, uh, a historical um, uh, analysis which is called linear period periodization in which it is considered that the, there are historical epochs which must be it, uh, which must be passed through in order to create a successful socialist revolution and according to Marx you had feudalism which passes through capitalism which then passes to socialism okay in order to get to socialism you have to go through capitalism according to Marx this was not the case in Russia. This was not the case in China. And that is why Trotsky, Bronstein, came to analyze the situation and recognized that you can have something which he called a permanent revolution based upon uneven and combined development, which jumps over any capitalist stage from a feudalistic economy because the national bourgeoisie is so weak that it becomes uh, an ally of imperialist powers or the previous feudal order obliterates itself from history as a result and uh, the only choice left to make an independent society in a national liberation struggle or in the pursuit of you know the liberation of the working class you are obliged to go into socialism immediately without passing through a capitalist stage so the early Zionists what did they have in common with the boon I mean both arose from the poor sectors of of Jewry and yeah. And Poland and Russia, Ashkenazi Jewry, and both, to some extent, dreamed of a, 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 of a better world, at least for the Jews, if not for all humanity. Uh, I, w I wouldn't say so. I would say that the Zionists arose from a middle class that sought to assimilate itself into uh, secular society, but found that they were unable to do so, that they were discriminated against, and they were not allowed to assimilate into the society as such. And so they sought to create a society within which they could have equal rights, and that was a society with a Jewish nation-state. So they sought to recreate the Christian nation-states of Europe in their own name and uh, in pursuit of their own liberation. But that was merely the liberation of the uh, middle-class elements, the professional elements. The national bourgeoisie which supported such a project, which um, dragged along a certain segment of the Jewish working class because they promised them heaven on earth. Oh, so it was really... So whereas the boon actually genuinely arose from the Jewish working class, Zionism actually arose from the bourgeoisie. From the middle class, first of all, then they then they got the uh, attention of the Jewish bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. you know, because the initial affiliation, initial sort of you know, pursuit you know of any national bourgeoisie, of course, is uh, wealth and, and not you know, uh, not uh, li their uh, their own liberation until they realize 
that they are subject to uh, the same oppression as any other member of the Jewish community when the time comes. So they then uh, realize that they have to sort of develop a political program in order to protect themselves. To get their wealth. Their wealth. To, to, make, for the to keep their wealth. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does the people like, I mean, people now, like, the similarity between Zionism and Bundism is the recognition of the national identity of the Jewish people, which the Marxists did not recognize. Mm -hmm. That's where the similarity does exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this similarity of the recognition of Jewish identity was shared by the Autonomists, which founded the World Jewish Congress, and the Canadian Jewish Congress, and the American Jewish Congress, etc., etc., and the Territorialists, who sought to achieve a Jewish territory, a Jewish homeland, <coughs> but not by displacing another people like the Zionists have done. Israel Zang Zangville was one of the uh, spokespersons for the Territorialist movement, and he's the one who developed the slogan, uh, a land without a people for a people without a land. The Zionists stole that slogan and used it for Palestine, even though they knew that the Palestinians existed. But the Palestinians didn't have independence. They didn't have their own nation state. So by that definition, <coughs> they consider that the Palestinians <coughs> did not exist as a people. Mm. Oh, because they didn't. Yeah, because they were stuck with the nation state concept of the people. Because they didn't have their independence, yeah. So they weren't considered to be a people. Yeah, yeah. So who were the autonomous? And what, what were the territorial? What was their? Uh, so they they were they were alongside the Zionists and wanting some kind of territorial autonomy for the Jewish people at that time. No, they weren't really alongside the Zionists. They were uh, aside the, the the Zionists and and the other political tendencies. But they never got very far. There were various sort of you know initiatives. You know there was one even uh, territorialist who wanted to form a Jewish territory in North America. Oh, near really? Detroit. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. He wanted to call it um, Arafat or something like that. Arafat? Yeah, like yeah. Mount Arafat, uh, oh, oh, where okay. Noah landed. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. But there was a uh, Jewish territory established, you know, in the, <coughs> in the Soviet Union, a Jewish Autonomous Republic of Vir Bajan. Oh, yeah? Yeah. When? That was established in 1926. And it still it, exists today? Yeah, it still exists today, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have a republic status anymore because it's... Uh, because it declined in importance. So it's in a Jewish autonomous region now, which um, has an, a national language of Yiddish located near the Chinese border. Oh, really? Yeah. So is it heavily populated? What is it? Uh, no, it has one city. It has a newspaper in Yiddish. Oh. But uh, when the high-speed train from China goes north to Siberia, it will have uh, uh, a link to the world, which uh, will provide it with easy access, so that may uh, rejuvenate it as a, as a site. Oh, wow. So what were the, uh, who, uh, who was the autonomous group? What were they? Uh, they sought to, uh, to achieve a certain degree of political autonomy for the Jewish people so they could have a Jewish voice within the countries uh, in the diaspora that they were living in. So they formed the World Jewish Congress, uh, the, uh, you know, the national Jewish congresses of each country, which lobbied. It was like a lobbying organization on behalf of the Jewish community, mm -hmm. lobbying for civil rights, you know, but they didn't have a sense of, um, of, uh, they didn't have a program that extended, you know, to national cultural autonomy like the Bund did. Mm. So who who developed the concept of national cultural uh, autonomy? autonomy? Oh, there there were various uh, Jewish theorists, you know, in the Bundist movement, uh, mm. uh, but it's difficult to say. I think it was developed, you know, in in order to present a program for adoption at the 1903 uh, Social Democratic Congress of the Russian Party. Mm. But um, because the Bund was expelled as the first order of business, uh, they never got to present it, you know, for adoption. Because they wanted to um, present a concept of a federation, a federated society, with recognition for the Jewish people as well as other nationalities. Mm. But both the um, Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, you know, had a nation-state concept, in the either bourgeois or proletarian which uh, had a very centralized conception of what, you know, the, um, the revolutionary regime was going to be. And, in effect, that's what they did. The Bolsheviks instituted, you know, a Bolshevik dictatorship of the proletariat, which uh, eventually destroyed the internal opposition in the Communist Party, <coughs> and then destroyed the external opposition uh, amongst the, uh, the anarchists and, uh, and uh, with, uh, with uh, centralized state apparatus as such in contradiction with the nature of civil society, 
they uh, eventually uh, destroyed the whole project and it dissolved, you know, in <coughs> 1989. It's getting a bit cold now. This is uh, winter time in uh, Palestine. During the day, it's like summer. And then as soon as the sun goes down behind the mountain over there, mm -hmm. it gets very cold. Well, should we go inside? Yes, let's take a break. The territory is a locational land-based community. A country is a locational land-based community with sovereignty included. In the context of a territory, those who are part of that society are members of that territory. In the context of a country, those who are part of that society are citizens of that country. Basically, territory and country are both grouping of people on land. The difference is country has sovereignty and territory does not have sovereignty. As for the state, the state is when the citizenry is the repressive subject of the country. Okay? So in case you didn't get that Country and territory are both groupings of people on land. So a country is a grouping of people on land just the same as a territory is a grouping of people on land. The difference, however, would be that a country would be based on some, some type of sovereignty, whereas a territory would not. The state would be when there is the repressive mechanics within that country to keep the people repressed in a sort of dictation. You can also say that the repression that is the state is a type of dictatorship. There is always some kind of dictatorship in that sort of society. A truly autonomous society does not have statehood. Statehood is often considered necessary to repress certain types of segments of society that are seen hostile. That is how the state arises. So, next we have to clarify what is nationality, what is nation. Nation is cultural gathering of peoplehood. A nation could be based on culture and religion, such as the Jewish nation, or, you know, it could be based on culture and ethnicity, such as the Romanian nation. Now, both the Jewish nation and the Romanian nation would constitute as people nations, and both would also constitute as diaspora nations. There is more than one religious culture that constitutes a nation, and there is more than one ethnic culture that constitutes a, a nation. I think most people understand to some extent or another, although I would argue this as it's one of the top things that I personally study is religion. But still, nonetheless, most people could understand what religiosity means, or what it is, sort of. I would still debate that, because I, I had a teacher that really <laughs> went into depth with this with me. And we will approach that topic soon. But right now, our bigger focus is going to have to be ethnicity, for certain very important reasons. There is no such thing as race. This is very important. Race, there's only the human race. Maybe you believe in the elves, maybe you believe in the dwarves, and that's fine if you do, but those would be different races. As far as the human race is concerned, there are no sub-races within the human race. Eugenics may try to argue differently, but eugenics has no basis in either science or mysticism. It's completely fraudulent. And we outright reject it. If you are with eugenics, you are against the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement. And we will oppose you and you will lose. 
so ethnicity. Now, there's been a lot of talk by racists lately about, well, nobody is pure this or that, as a way to justify further land grabbings of the indigenous on this continent. I'm referring, of course, to the Atlantic continent, sometimes referred to, or sometimes referred to as the Americas. Uh, they have their own term for this continent, and I do think that we should start ab adopting whatever the indigenous term is for this continent. And I used to know it, but it was always hard for me to pronounce, and I can't, it does not come to mind right now, and I apologize. Ethnicity. Ethnicity is the common ancestry continuation of a people. That is what ethnicity is. That's ethnicity in a nutshell. It is the common ancestry continuation of a people. All right. So many people will look at, um, they will look at Mexicans and say, "Well, these are not really indigenous because they're mixed." While forgetting that the same has to apply to the Europeans on the American continent and the black people on the American continent. Malcolm X had European blood, but he was not European whatsoever. Several people in the United States of America have African blood, but they are not African whatsoever. They are European. This is because of ethnicity. Ethnicity is the common ancestry continuation of a people. So. That is very important because this helps the parameters to justify what should not have to be justified, and that is the indigenous voice. I have spoken of the Machika movement. I learned fully of the Machika movement by Donna Newman. I had heard of it before from a previous teacher in detail, sort of, but I got the real hands-on experience from our wonderful emissary of solidarity, Donna Newman. The Bundist movement was formed by, originally, the three founders. Dr. Abram Weisfeld, myself, and Donna Newman. Dr. Abram Weisfeld is not just the founder, but he is the chairman of the revolution. As we are developing, we're trying to discover which one of us is, has the right to pull which clause. One of the clauses that we definitely know that Dr. Weisfeld can poll is the right to question certain communist troops. He can determine the parameters of what to ask a Marxist-Leninist, a Trotskyist, the anarchists, whether it's the anarcho-syndicalist, anarcho-communist. One of the clauses I think I should be allowed to pull is the right to block off hostile groups, such as the classical Marxists and the mutualists. This is still something we're discussing. One of the clauses that I'm pretty sure that Donna Newman should be able to pull is who we definitely need to take seriously in matters of solidarity, because she is the emissary of solidarity. Now, I think I should clarify to people, because not only has this confused other people, this has begun to confuse me. But people think I am the Bundist movement. I am not the Bundist movement. I am the cleric of public relations. And part of what is what what people need to understand about what we are doing is we are trying to raise the consciousness level that people seem to so much lack, such as the subject of who are the Palestinians? Why do we keep saying that they are indigenous Israelites? Well, aside from the fact that that's just correct and that's factual, we need people to be in conscious of the indigenous, that the indigenous have a right to the restoration of their sovereignty. And those of us non-hostile may be allowed to remain as permanent residents. And that may seem radical, but it's not like the natives have ever said, even, they, even with everything that they have gone through, they do not ask for the expulsion of Europeans. But as far as sovereignty is concerned, the United States of America is a toxic institution that should have never been created. And all of the sacred mountains have been taken away from the indigenous and they should be restored to them and the pipelines should stop being built so 
So when someone says, well, I'm part Cherokee, but they do not engage in Cherokee culture, that claim falls flat. Also, if you only have a certain amount of Cherokee in you, that wouldn't really count for anything, and not to mention it is white settler mentality that determined those DNA tests. That is not how the Cherokee identify themselves. And I know that this is a consistent trend. Everybody's grandmother's Cherokee, apparently. That's very racist. That's a way. Of, that's a way because deep down, consciously, some part of us collectively understands we don't belong to this land that we are on. Now, Donna Newman has directed some literature that will be coming forth in the following videos. I'm now going to bring you to this next film, and as far as we can trace it, this video was released on January 16th, 2012. This is from one of the spokesmen of the Machika movement. Pay attention to this, because this is going to define further parameters of further discussions that we need to start discussing especially if we are going to take the notion of the liberation of Palestine seriously. Applying for this job and I'm asked to mark down my ethnicity and it says, are you Hispanic? Scratch, no. Are you Latino? No. Um, no, I'm not. I am Mexican. I am indigenous. I do not come from Spain. Hispanic means a person or things belonging to Spain. I'm not a Spaniard. I'm not. Yeah, the Spaniards have, you know, killed our people and invaded our lands and are still holding power in our lands, but that doesn't connect me to them. I am not connected to them. I'm not linked to them. Rape doesn't define ethnicity. Not in our case. We're not going to allow rape to define who we are. So Hispanic, no, we're not Hispanic. Um, if we speak English, they say, oh, well, you speak Spanish, so you're Hispanic. So based on that logic, people that speak English should call themselves Britannic, whether they be from China, from Kenya. I mean, they're speaking English, right? No, that's not really the logic that's accepted. But somehow when it comes to our people, we're supposed to say, oh, we speak Spanish, we're Hispanic. Doesn't work that way. Rape and genocide and colonialism are not going to define who we are. And now we have the term Latino. Are you Latina? No, I'm not Latina. I am not a Southern European. A lot of people think that a Southern European is no longer white, is no longer European, but they haven't seen a map. Um, Latin means Southern Europeans, Italians, Portuguese, French. No, nope, we're not any of those things. We are Mexican, Central American, if you're from Guatemala, Guatemalteco, if you're from Honduras, Hondureño. We are indigenous people. We are indigenous people. We are mixed blood and full blood indigenous people. The occupation of our lands for the last 500 years has been a very devastating impact and has had a very confusing effect on our people. But that's because of the education system that only reflects a colonial ideology and a very... Um, indoctrinating education system that wants us to neglect and wants us to hate who we are, hate ourselves. We have a huge, huge dilemma, huge um, problem with self-hate in our, in our communities. But no, we're not Hispanic. Speaking a colonial language that we were forced to speak 500 years ago is not definitive of who we are. Um, the fact that the majority of our people have been scarred with the Spanish or European blood and if you read the true history of that it was through rape so no we're not going to allow ourselves to be defined by rape latino we're not going to be uh, defining ourselves by europe that defines a european you want a latino um look in the map and look at europe there's your other latinos you want a spaniard a true hispanic like someone like enrique iglesias julio iglesias rocio durcal that's what we're talking about those are true hispanics we're not hispanic we're indigenous. We are Nicantlaca. We are Mexican. We are Central American. We are native. We are people original of this continent. We're tired of being mislabeled and colonized even more with the definitions of who we are. We're not Hispanic. We're not Latino. We're not white. We're not half white. We're not crippled white. We're not um, an offshoot of white. 
we are indigenous. Full blood and mixed blood indigenous people. Not white. Get it right, people. We're not white. We're not Hispanic. We're not Latino. We're Mexican. Look more into it. www.mexica-movement.org Not Hispanic. Not Latino. We are indigenous. No to colonialism. We're not going to allow colonialism to further define us and kill us and tell us who the hell we are.